service. Uh, welcome to those who are on Zoom as well. I'd like us to sit quietly, think, um, <coughs> pray while David plays this beautiful organ prelude for us from Cavalier of the to come. <coughs> that revealed hope out of devastation, that released freedom in spite of imprisonment, and brought us forgiveness, forgiveness instead of punishment. Thank you that we can now walk in the light of your life, hope, truth, freedom and forgiveness, this day and every day. Today we pray also for the royal family in their grief. We pray that you would encompass them around with your love and your strength. May they know your presence with them. Thank you for Prince Philip's life of service, for the care he showed to his family, for the encouragement that he was to all of our young people through the Duke of Edinburgh Award. We thank you that he cared for the environment. And we thank you mostly, Lord, for his love and esteem for his wife. We thank you for his life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing all hail the power of Jesus' name.
have so much in our lives, so much that we can enjoy, so much that is given freely to us. We're in a privileged country. We're in a privileged place. Sometimes I think we tend to grumble about things. I think we tend to want more and more, and yet we have so much. And we can only give a little, I know, to what God does in our lives and in our, in our lives and in our world. But I encourage you to give. I read a really interesting book, actually I read it a couple of times, it's called The Grace of Giving by Stephen Alford. And it really is a grace to be able to give, not just here on a Sunday, but the way we live our lives, the things that we're involved in, all of those things are part of giving. So I encourage you to give and we'll pray now and thanks for what you will give and what you have given. God's promises stand true forever. He will satisfy our needs, even in the desert times. He will guide us and strengthen us. He will allow us to flourish, even in the most difficult of times. For his spirit within us is the spring that never fails, never dries up, never stops flowing. There's grace enough for today, and he reminds us that he is always near. We offer our gifts to you, Lord, with grateful and cheerful hearts. Thank you that you meet our needs each and every day, providing what we need when we need it. Trust in you we can share what we have with others, and we do this joyfully today, together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. The first reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God say that you shall not eat any fruit in the tree, in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the servant said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the trees were to be desired to make one wise, she took one of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The second reading is from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 21 to 24. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? There is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a saviour. There is no one beside me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone forth in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear. Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. All who were incensed against him shall come to him and be ashamed. Let's stand together and sing, Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature. <coughs>
us pray. Our Holy One, Heavenly Father, we call to you and name you as eternal, ever present and boundless in love. Yet there are times, O oh God, when we fail to recognize you in the regular day-to-day -day activities of our lives. Sometimes shame clenches tightly around our hearts and we hide our true feelings. Sometimes fear makes us small and we miss the chance to speak from your strength. Sometimes doubt invades our hopefulness and we degrade your wisdom. Holy God, in the daily round from sunrise to sunset, remind us again of your holy presence hovering near us and in us. Free us from shame and self-doubt. Help us to see you in the moment by moment possibilities to live honestly, to act courageously and to speak from your wisdom in every situation in which we find ourselves. Help us to trust in you. Amen. The next reading is from Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and was taken to his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggles against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and chastises every child who he accepts. And the next reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it's from there that we're expecting a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation so that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to him.
May our knowledge of your suffering and crucifixion help us to feel the tension between great sacrifice and great love, between suffering and redemption, between death and life, between fleeting and the eternal. Help us to experience the unseen force of grace and obedience and weep with both joy and sorrow at the great cost. Thank you for your great love in providing such a costly remedy so that we can have eternal life with you. Amen. Every week we pray the Lord's Prayer. Um, some of us pray with the old words and some of us pray with the new words. But often we pray whichever words without really thinking about what we're saying because it has become sort of something you just do. And uh, Roy and I subscribe to Barnabas Fund and their magazine came to us last week, the latest one, and in it was this beautiful meditation on the Lord's Prayer. And I thought as part of our free time now that we could enjoy uh, reading it as we listen to Chris read it to us. Please uh, yeah, enjoy it. Meditation, <coughs> excuse me, meditation on the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, who alone knows our brokenness and pain, who honours us by making us your children, equal members of your family, and give us a new identity as your beloved chosen people. Hallowed be your name, for you are pure and sinless. You are the great I am, before whom we stand in awe, God of truth and righteousness, God of mercy and justice. Your kingdom come, let your glorious rule cover the earth and banish all injustice, cast out all corruption and right all wrongs. Set your people free from oppression and let your reign begin in us. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to accept your purposes, your good and perfect plan for our lives. As one day all creation will submit and bow before you, in whom is perfect peace and freedom. Give us today our daily bread, for we are poor and needy, and we depend on you. Father, provide our food and water, our clothing and shelter, Day by day, our eyes look to you and forgive our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Father, forgive us our many sins through the shed blood of your Son, who died for us and rose again. Release us from the burden of our debts and give us grace to forgive those in debt to us. Father, make us generous and merciful and lead us not into temptation. Father, give us faith to overcome our fears, doubts and worries. Father, do not test us more than we can bear. Give us the strength to endure patiently, the grace to accept and persevere. Give us a life of godliness and contentment. Deliver us from the evil one. Father, rescue us from Satan's wiles. Free us from bondage. Snatch us from calamity, death, and the injustice of evil men. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Father, establish your sovereign rule, glorify your name, and keep us safe for now and eternity. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you to Barnabas Fund for allowing us to read that and to also be able to copy it so that you could all have a copy of that. Stand and sing again. Let us run with perseverance.
probably don't need to say anything after that. <laughs> Only he has the words of life. As many of you know, I love words. One of the things I used to love to do with my children when I was teaching, I had a gifted and talented class of children from second grade to sixth grade, about 30 of them. And one of the things we did in because they were pretty smart, they were pretty good spellers, they could all read, they were way off the charts as, you know, past 18 and they were only, you know, 8, 9, 10. So we delve into the dictionary not just to find the meaning of the words, but to find out where they came from. To find if they came from Latin or Greek or Sanskrit or wherever else. And we would look at when and how they came into the English language. And I've always been fascinated. Whenever I hear a new word, and Roy can tell you, I'll immediately go to the dictionary, find out what it means, and where did it come from. How did it get into our language? When I was at Moody, one of the lecturers there used to have us take, like David did a couple of weeks ago, a verse. And we had to go through every single word in that verse. It didn't matter if it was an of or a we or an an. You had to look at every single one to see what that word meant. Why was it there? Why was it in that sentence? What meaning did it have? And then how did it all fit together? I wanted today to look at the word look. What do we mean when we say look? Uh, it can be a really fleeting sort of a thing, can't it, to look at something and just sort of glance and look away. Um, you might gaze at it, maybe look at it a little bit longer. You might um, peep at it. You know, you might lift up something and just peep at it. You might scan it and look at something from you know, right across. You often do that with your cameras, don't you? Sort of <coughs> scan right across the scene in front of you. In fact, if you look in the thesaurus, you'll find many, many words that are synonyms for the word look. Or look can also mean that idea of considering, regarding, thinking about something, inspecting it. The list is lengthy. Today I want us to, to consider looking to Jesus. The word look in Hebrew, uh, the word that we're looking at anyway from the two passages that uh, Chris read for us. The first one is ra a, and it has the idea of intense looking, requires intense looking to do it. So that when Eve looked at it, that's what she was doing. And Panga in the Isaiah, which means not only intensely looking, but you have to think about it, and you have to look, and then you have to change a direction. It makes, it involves making a choice. Sadly, Adam and Eve looked, but did not turn around and therefore they made the wrong choice. 3.16 in Genesis says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she gave it also to her husband with her and he ate. This look from Eve wasn't just a peep, it wasn't a glance. Rather, she's regarded it, thought about it, considered it, focused on it, inspected it, turned her mind to it. It wasn't a spur of the moment thing. She then made a choice. The result was that she ate the fruit of the tree that God had told her not to do. And that Adam, with his eyes wide open, had also eaten the fruit. Adam's Sin was no less than Eve's. In fact, in Romans 5.12, we read that it was Adam's sin that caused the fall of man. Humankind's complete and utter separation from God. I reckon that one could argue that those are probably the most tragic words in human history. Sin has entered into God's wonderful world, his very good creation for the first time. Eve and Adam had crossed the line. And what were her motivations for doing that? Well, she looked, she made the wrong choice, and she took on a course of action which was wrong because she looked at it and it was good for food. It appealed to her physical bodily appetites. 
that was pleasant to the eyes. So it appealed to her emotions and it was desirable to make one wise. It appealed to her mind and spirit and her pride of knowledge and spiritual insight. In, um, in 1 John 2.16, we're told that basically we face the same um, temptations, I suppose, the same ways we look at temptation. It talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Jesus faced those temptations too, but unlike us, who always seem to fall into those sins, he didn't ever fall into those sins. And he faced each of them out in the desert. He didn't succumb to the devil's temptations, the devil's schemes. He's the only one ever to completely do the will of God. And it led to his death on the cross. So we could be forgiven and have our relationship with God restored. We, like Eve, are really susceptible to temptation. Chris read the, the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. We're really susceptible to it. We can't meet God's demands on our own. We're in a really sad position. But who can help us? So we too, who are separated from God, we too can be saved by a look. We can be saved by a look. In Isaiah 45, 22, it says, look to me and be saved. It also has that idea of turn, look or turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So why do we need to look to Jesus? An incident in the Old Testament shows us the effects of sin in our lives. And because of sin, everybody is under the curse of death. And you can all remember back to the time in the wilderness uh, when the people had been grumbling, you know, for about 40 years, they continued to grumble and grumble and grumble. They rebelled against God and his goodness to, to them. They had a terrible track record. You know, God was constantly gracious to them, constantly faithful. Just imagine, Roy and I watched almost all of the Ten Commandments again the other day, and this will be the middle one, and it ran out just before the end. <laughs> But again, it just reminded me of how God led those people out of Egypt. He led them away from Pharaoh's army. He delivered them from them. He provided water and protection in the desert. He'd given them food every morning, manna and quail. Still they grumbled and grumbled. And finally, in judgment, remember he sent those deadly snakes among them. Now, it wasn't very long before they cried out to Moses saying, quick, you know, we're really sorry, we've been doing the wrong thing. Quick, talk to God and make everything right for us. So God said to Moses, put a serpent up on a bronze pole and put it in the midst of the people. If they look at that bronze serpent, they'll be healed, they'll be saved. If they don't, well, they won't be. So whoever looked at that bronze serpent on the pole lived. God had graciously provided a remedy for the curse of death that we too are under. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be lifted up on the pole for us. Whoever looks at him will be saved. God could have removed the deadly snakes, but instead he provided a remedy. The only thing that people had to do was actually look at it in faith. To God's remedy. To many people this story really sounds absurd and I suppose to many people today the story of Jesus dying on the cross seems absurd. But we need to believe God's promise that all who look to Jesus and his death as the just payment for their sins will be forgiven and granted eternal life. We can be reunited with God. The result of looking was life for the Israelites for us, for all of us who turn and look to Jesus, turn away from everything else and look only to him, we have eternal life, abundant, joyous life in the presence of God forever. So we need to look to Jesus to be saved and to have our relationship with God restored. 
But we have a life to live until we enter fully into his eternal presence. And it's interesting that God calls this life a race. The race set before us from Hebrews 12 that Chris read. Let us run with patience the race which is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So God doesn't just say, okay, um, turn to me and you'll be saved, and then sort of sit back. We have a life to live, and he's there with us. Remember the, the writer of the Hebrews has just said, all of chapter 11, talking about different witnesses, wonderful stories of what God had done through different people. And then in chapter 12, he says, this cloud of witnesses. So I, I can't remember how many were in Hebrews 11, but there were a lot. But even more than that, a cloud of witnesses. They're there, not just as examples of faith, which is true, but it says, the idea is that they're there championing, championing us on in our race too. I, you know, I, I wasn't just thinking only of those people who were in the scriptures. I was thinking of people like Doreen Smith, those of you who remember Doreen and Perry who were here. For me, uh, Doreen was a wonderful example. But she wasn't just an example, she was a wonderful encourager. She championed me all the time. It's right and keep going, keep going, keep going. I think of Ruth Wheatley, Ruth sitting out there. For a long, long time she served the Lord Jesus. She's a, a wonderful example to us all. And not only that, she also is there cheering us on, encouraging us. I could talk about Heather. I could talk about Virginia. I could talk about many, many in this congregation who are not only wonderful examples of looking to Jesus, but are wonderful examples of those who cheer us on. We have something to do. We have to lay aside the encumbrances we have, the sin that we have. An encumbrance might just be, might be a sin, but it just might be something that we think about more than we, you know, we should. It's an endurance race. Let us run. We're all in this together. This race, the word actually comes from the Greek word, word agona, which is like agony. It means to struggle. It means conflict. So this race isn't just going to be an easy little sprint or a little stroll in the park. It's a struggle. And for many of us, it's a struggle all the time. But we are, in, we are in this literally together. Barclay says this endurance race is a determination, unhurrying yet undelaying, which goes steadily on and refuses to be deflected. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, to look at him. He is our focus, our inspiration, our example. The idea again is that we look away from everything else and look only unto him. Some of you all know I used to be a swimmer, just train up and down that pool, be up at five o'clock in the morning, swim for two and a half miles before school, swim for two and a half miles after school. I loved breaststroke, it's my best stroke. Unfortunately, I was in the same group as Beverly Whitfield who won the breaststroke <laughs> in Tokyo. So I didn't even get to represent the school rats. But, in the local swimming club, she wasn't in mine, thank goodness, um, you'd race each Friday night. And I used to have a, I had to wait for 27 seconds. I had to give everybody else that much start, uh, just in freestyle. And I knew that what I had to do was aim for the goal. I had to keep going. I had to not bother when I took a breath trying to see where everyone else was, because that would slow me down. Many of the pools also have a line down the middle of your lane. So it takes you straight to the goal. And if I fixed my eyes on that line that led me directly to the goal, then I was straight and headed right there. Jesus 
is like that. He is not only the goal that we're ending up with, but he is like that line going under that water, leading us straight to, he's with us the whole time. He's the ultimate example of Christian endurance. But by looking to him and fixing our eyes on him, it's not just he is an example to us, but he is our light, our life, our guidance, our encouragement and our joy. The race itself isn't a joy necessarily for everyone. The cross definitely wasn't a joy for Jesus, but he was able to look past the horror of the cross to the joy beyond it. He understood that good would come from this, a redeemed and rescued people, those of us who love him, <coughs> honouring God for all eternity. Probably one of the most uh, difficult elements of torture on the cross <coughs> is the extreme shame. And then scripture tells us there that uh, he despised the shame, yet he endured it. He bore shameful accusations of blasphemy, shameful beating, shameful crown, shameful robe. It's a stumbling block for many of us, isn't it? We'll do anything for Jesus except, except suffer shame or embarrassment. But after that shame came the glory. He sat at the right hand of God. We too will be glorified. Within verse 12 too, is the, in verse 2 also, is the amazing promise that we can hold on to in those times of trouble and discouragement. Jesus is the author, he begins our faith, and he's the finisher of our faith. He will bring it to completion. Jesus stands with us throughout our lives. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So at the end of our lives, at the end of our Christian lives, we're still looking for Christ. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for our Saviour, for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. To the look here is a Greek word which means waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ in glory at his return, to long for the coming of the kingdom of God. This looking is not just looking but eagerly waiting for and looking taking our attention away from everything else. These days we don't hear much about, um, many sermons really, about the return of Jesus, but it was his promise. And it's something that we can look to. We can see wonderful things ahead of us. We can see something that God has in store for us. We should be ready at all times for the coming of the Lord. At all times we should be constantly concerned with what pleases him, who is our source of joy. God has placed us here on this earth to glorify him. In time, here and now, we should vote and pay our taxes. We should become involved in the affairs of time. We should take every opportunity to be involved in our communities. But we are citizens of heaven too. And to anticipate heaven from our colony here on earth, focuses on fully a fully restored fellowship with God, that fellowship that was broken way back in Genesis chapter 3. To become exclusively involved in the colony here on earth deprives us of hope, and we can become so overwhelmed by some of the terrible things that we see in our world that we can become so focused on that that we lose our hope. Jesus is our hope. We look to him. If we only champion the causes of time, we lose sight of our real home. If we lose sight of the eternal perspective, we no longer represent our citizenship. In our service on Good Friday, David Milliken told us that we need to look to Jesus in the midst of suffering. We do suffer. We will suffer in every situation we face. Look at the reality of what he is saying. He suffered humiliation and many other things. We need to look to Jesus and study the way to handle suffering. In fact, we need to look to Jesus for every aspect of our lives. See how he handled every situation. The very best example for us to follow. For salvation out of any trouble, no matter how big or small, we should look to God alone. For eternal salvation, we should look to God alone.
Jesus said, no one shall pluck them out of my hand. It is a sure salvation. He will always keep us to himself. David finished his message with the words, and I quote, the way we look to him will determine our eternal destiny. Jesus died to give us life. He walks with us to live life here on this earth. He will return and complete his work of salvation in each one of us who believes in him. Indeed, the way we look to him will determine our eternal destiny. I'd like us to join together now in prayer. And uh, the <coughs> words in bold, if you can join in with me, that would be wonderful. Our God, our Father, we thank you for every part of the life of Jesus. We thank you for his life, that he had to grow up and learn just as we have to do, that he had to go to school and learn a trade and to work at a job just as we have to do, that he knows well what everyday work and life are like. We, we thank, thank you, our God. God. For his words of wisdom and his deeds of love, for his kindness to the sick, suffering and sad, for his friendship with all kinds of people, even the people the respectable would have nothing to do with. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you for his death, for the courage which made him go to the cross, for the obedience which made him accept your will without question, for the love which suffered and bore all that for us. We, we thank, thank you, Lord God. We thank you for his resurrection, that he conquered death and rose from the grave, that he is alive forevermore, that he is with us always, even to the end of the world, that nothing in life or in death can separate us from him. We, we thank, thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can look to you in every situation and that we can trust you to provide for us throughout our lives as we seek to love and serve you. We, we thank, thank you, Lord. Amen. Please stand and sing, God is our strength and refuge.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you know the, the verses, you can sing with me. Otherwise, I'm sure you'll know the chorus. Thank you.